I got started in Inlay pretty much by necessity. I was doing commercial cabinet work in Ohio. I wanted to do reproduction furniture. You can't do that in Ohio. There's no market there. So I moved to the East Coast, and the shop I went to work in already had a carver. They already had a uh, turner, finisher. They wanted to branch into federal furniture. That was starting to come into vogue, and uh, they needed someone to learn it. So I took it on, and it was a good fit. I'm used to working in detail because I used to be a mechanic, and it was just a natural fit. The skills involved for doing inlay, well, I mean, there's some fundamental ones. You should have pretty good hand-eye coordination. You should be able to see. Uh, as I'm getting older, that's proving to be more and more of an issue. Um, a lot of it's attitude. You just have to be willing to dive in and experiment. I mean, there is no 1812 book on how to do inlay the right or wrong way. Uh, people, people approach inlay from a lots of different directions. They get different results. Is it right? Is it wrong? Is the person who's making it happy? That's the bottom line. So dive in and start and see if it's a fit. Where do you apply inlay? Anywhere. And uh, you know, I mean that seriously. I mean, most of my work's traditional. We, we know that it's been established. Um, but I mean, you know, here's a little box that I had to make for my inlay tools and. I just threw a little piece of, of banding in there just, you know, to, to make it look neat. But, I mean, when I say the sky's the limit, I'm serious. I teach a lot of workshops. And I do some of these exercises where it's, you know, one radius tool and what, what patterns can you come up with. Or, or just explore for a while. Give them an afternoon and just do their own thing. And it is absolutely amazing what people come up with. Far more creative people than me coming up with designs where I would never think to do that. God, it looks cool. So I'd say it's to the eye of the beholder on what they want to do. Well, that's a really tricky question. <laughs> um, the idea of adding inlay to another piece. Um, now, if you have a chest of drawers that was made in 1800 and you're trying to put some inlay on it and make it look good, uh, that might even be a felony. So, I, you know, it just depends. It's, um, you can add inlay to a finished piece as long as you're not trying to like fake an original. But if you've already made a piece and want to go back and add to it, uh, it just depends. You're going to have a problem with finishing. People often ask that question at workshops, do you finish the piece and then set the inlay in? And for me, the answer is no, because you have to flush it to the surface at some point, and that's going to take the finish off. So. Yes, yeah, so I do consider myself in the tradition of inlay making and cabinet work. And this is something I actually feel very, very strongly about because I teach full time and I have a class of 22 to 25 students every year who are the greatest kids in the world. 99%, 99.999% of the people who do furniture making, who do stonework, who do plumbing, who do whatever, who build this world, are traditional craftsmen following doing a job. You'll never know their names. Most of this world was built by people who were, who were just anonymous. It's not the artist, it's the craftsman. I view myself a craftsman and I'm strictly in that tradition. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. People often wonder why I prefer reproductions over um, original design. Well, first off, I do do some original design, not a lot. It's not what my clientele seems to come to me for. Um, and I'm mostly doing more interpretation where I'm synthesizing pieces. But it's, it's clearly an inner reproduction flavor. Um, because I like it. Because I don't feel overly comfortable as a designer. I think it goes back to that artist-craftsman thing. I feel very comfortable as a craftsman. And when woodworking is performed properly, to me, it almost is a performance thing. Um, from getting from A to B in a smooth, straight line with everything just, just being right. You know, if we'd apply some of the same standards as we do to other arts, to, to furniture work, I couldn't imagine going up to someone like Itzhak Perlman and say, so when are you going to write your own stuff? He didn't write it. He's playing it. I didn't write it. 
I'm just kind of playing it. That's sort of how I look at it. How do I determine which inlay to put on a piece, or how much, or how little? Well, that depends on a lot of things. Um, if it's a piece I'm just making for fun, it'll be, in terms of proportion, my eye will tell me that. Um, in terms of the style, my eye will also tell me that. Um, it, and that's basically ba um, coming from experience, precedence, and personal taste. Now, going back to the tradition, um, how much can they afford? Do you want four faces of the table inlaid, or do you want six faces of the table inlaid, or do you want all of the faces inlaid? I mean, back in the 1800s, there was uh, the Book of Prices, and people basically paid a set fee for how many curves do you want to put in, how many pieces of stringing do you put in. I mean, it's like basically going down and buying a car and picking all the details you want put in. It's what can you afford. So that has a big role in it, too, if it's for a client. Can you do inlay in contemporary furniture? Absolutely. There's people who are doing all sorts of uh, wonderful stuff. Garrett Heck does a great job incorporating inlay into furniture work. I mean, beautiful stuff. Mark Arnold, another craftsman in Ohio, great stuff. Um, Silas, Cuff. I mean, the list can go on and on and on of contemporary people who are bringing age-old skills, tweaking it in their own way, and just doing outstanding things. Well, fortunately, I get to teach furniture making, so that's great. And um, the, the, it was a big change of gears going from being a full-time cabinet maker to teaching because things had to throttle down. I mean, when you're working in the trade as a furniture maker, uh, put it this way, we have an overly romantic idea of what that's about. Um, the bottom line is a piece has been designed, a piece has been sold, and there's so many hours that it has to be done in to make it profitable. So it's pushing pretty hard all the time. Students need to learn that, and they don't have the skills to push that hard. Um, I love working with the kids. They, you know, people talk about how they have fears about the future. With the kids that come through my program, I don't have those fears. They're, they're wonderful, wonderful people. Um, so working with them is a real blessing. So that's a big, big perk from um, teaching. Another perk is, well, a downside is I get to make about four pieces a year anymore, and, and that's about it. The upside, though, is I have control over those four pieces. I get to make what I want to make. And um, that's a big perk as well. So all in all, it's, it's a really good combination. I mean, I have a very supportive school. It's, it's the best place in the world for me to be. So. If Steve, if we did a movie on Steve Lotta, which actor would play you and why? Which actor? For some reason, Malkovich comes to mind, but I can't imagine why. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Who would play me? A grouchy Clint Eastwood? Stallone? <laughs> I don't know. Thank you.